Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for coming on this Thursday morning, where you probably have other things to do, actually. I'm extremely grateful, of course, and feel very honored to have been invited for this uh, golden lecture series at the University of Opola. I'm especially grateful for the Vice Rector, Professor Lipok, to have come here to introduce me, but also to the Rector, Professor Masnik, and the Dean, Professor Drozik, and last but not least, to Professor Kulska, who did all the organizational work, as always. And um, I'm really happy that you're here. I hope you can all hear me well. Usually, I would, I would stand up and talk to you, but I'm not feeling so well today. I have a bad cold, as some of you may have noticed. So I, I'm not saying this for flattery. It's just true. And um, so I stay seated. And also, what I have done is I, I like to talk freely. But then this has a great danger, because I don't know how long it will take. It might take very long, or it might take very short. So what I did is I did some slides, which are kind of a summary of what I will be talking about. But I do have a text that I will try not to read, but I will present to you, um, because I know how long it is, more or less. And, um, and then for those whose English perhaps is not so excellent, but I know my, the Europa master students among you all speak perfect English, I, I know. Um, but for those who might not be able to follow immediately with these theoretical things that I do, as you said, I'm a theorist and I cannot hide that, um, though I try. Uh, I hope the presentation will help. And every now and then I will click on, uh, on the on my screen so that the next slide comes up and it's a summary of the, of the whole talk. So democracy and truth. I think that's a very important problem nowadays. And in order to introduce the problem, let me use an example. It will get theoretical later on, but I will try to use a few examples to make it a little bit less theoretical. Just three weeks ago, and I should probably click here. US District Judge Mark Walter issued a temporary injunction against a new law in Florida, the so-called Stop Wrongs to Our Kids and Employees, or for short, Stop Woke Act. This was an act of April 22. And this act is designed to make it impossible to teach certain things about racism, sexism, and the like in public schools and universities, and also in, in companies. Uh, and here is a quotation from Judge Walter's ruling. The, you find the quotation on the screen, and I'm reading it. Our professors, this is about us, our professors are cr critical to a healthy democracy. And the state of Florida's decision to choose which viewpoints are worthy of illumination and which must remain in the shadows has implications for us all. If our priests of democracy are not allowed to shed light on challenging ideas, then democracy will die in darkness. Well, professors as priests of democracy, uh, critical to a healthy democracy, less democracy should die in darkness. That seems to me not only an overly pathetic expression, but also substantially questionable. Is there really a strong and perhaps even a necessary relationship between democracy and academia, or more generally, between democracy and knowledge, and in the last instance, then between democracy and truth? And if so, what exactly is that relationship? And these are the questions I want to pursue in my lecture in order mainly to encourage you all to think about them some more. A plausible answer to the questions is far from self-evident. One reason for the difficulty is that democracy as well as truth, or rather knowledge of truth, are each of them complicated and contested. Hence, to avoid confusion and misunderstandings regarding truth or democracy, it is well worth spending a bit of analytical effort on them. 
This is not merely an academic exercise, otherwise it would be extremely boring for you. But I think it does have direct practical relevance for a number of reasons that you will probably all will be aware of, such as the ongoing pandemic, the brutal horrors of military aggression, once again, or an increasingly uninhabitable planet, and pervading it all, the unqualified mixture of truth and falsehoods being spread on the so-called social media, for all these and more reasons, widespread feelings of insecurity and uncertainty seem to be on the rise in practically all democratic societies, accompanied by mistrust in the ability of democratic institutions to cope with the current challenges, as well as in the ability of scientific expertise to provide reliable, unbiased knowledge. But insecurity and mistrust are bad counselors. They are disabilitating, paralyzing, if not worse, favoring the views of those who have been against democratic and academic freedoms all along. So we, and by we, I mean, maybe this is a bit daring, but I'm pretty confident that this is OK. I mean us, democratic citizens and participants in science, as researchers, teachers, or students. We need to overcome these feelings. And how can we do that? Part of the answer is certainly psychological. And I am not a psychological expert and will not say anything about that, because that is not my field at all. But from a general academic point of view, I believe that a necessary first step always is to get a clear view of the issues. In this case, democracy, knowledge of truth, and the relationship between them. And as a political scientist, I think I can perhaps offer a few useful thoughts to this end. I will first have a look at each of the two dimensions in turn, truth, knowledge, science, the epistemic dimension, we could call it, of our topic on the one hand, and then democracy, the political dimension, uh, on the other hand. And since this will have to be brief, I will focus on one aspect only, namely on what, is, what it is about these fields, the epistemic field and the political field, that makes them so difficult to understand, that is, so easily to misunderstand. And I will concentrate on just two major difficulties for each of these two dimensions. On that foundation, I can then turn to the question of the interaction between the two and highlight a few points concerning where and how the political and the epistemic spheres interact and intersect. So let's start with the first area, truth, knowledge, science. It's very hard to divide them up and, and take them apart. And for this talk, I think we can just see that whole epistemic um, area as the topic I'm talking about. And sometimes I will say truth. It's about truth. Sometimes it's about science trying to get to truth and so on. So that's a complex kind of thing. Let's begin with the epistemic sphere. It took humankind, and I, find, I personally find that very interesting, and I hope you do too. Uh, it took humankind a very long time to develop an understanding of science as we know it today. And not for want of trying, because as you know, practically forever human beings have tried to get more knowledge and so on. But science as we know it today, that is a very recent thing. To cut a long, complicated, and I think fascinating story short, I think one can say that one difficult matter to understand was how theoretical thought, such as general assumptions that we make about the world, and empirical evidence, particular observations we make in the world with what, whatever means um, available to us, our senses, our physical senses, bodily senses, or the instruments that have been developed over time, 
um, to assist and augment our senses, how these two areas, the theoretical and the empirical, are related, and what status should be given to one and the other. Nowadays, I think, for most of you, I assume it will seem obvious, at least to us as academics, that in the empirical sciences, I'm talking now only about the empirical sciences, um, because I cannot do another talk about the normative sciences. So in the empirical sciences, think of physics, chemistry, the life sciences, but also the social sciences. Observed evidence is decisive for accepting or rejecting theories. But that was not yet the case when, for instance, just 500 years ago, Copernicus, Copernic in Polish, should I? Kopernik, Mikolaev Kopernik, began to formulate his theoretical conclusions around 1520-22. He started writing this, so it's just 500 years ago, uh, from what he had observed in the sky. So he made observations and then started, tried to, he, he saw that the received theories didn't fit to that and, and, and tried to get to, uh, somehow get, uh, get his observations into the theories. And at the time, that was by no means the natural thing to do. Um, many new observations that were made with ever-improving instruments were put aside, mentally bracketed, ignored, or actively denied, as you know, um, not only until Copernic, but much later. Um, very many observations were just denied. And why were they, de they denied? They were denied if they could not be made to fit with the received view of the word, the received theory about how the word works. And it was at that time then the theories that determined which empirical evidence was acceptable. So we made observa oh, they made observations and they, well, w what wasn't supposed to be could not be. So they had to put that away and deny it and so on. Um, so it was not the case that the evidence determined which theories were tenable. It was the other way around. Note that here I'm speaking not about a wider general public, which in that era did not have much chance to get any kind of education anyway. I'm speaking of scholars, of academics, of men. There were almost only men at the time of men of learning. They were interested in acquiring true knowledge, but even for them, it was far from natural and self-evident to put empirical data, not even their own first-hand observational data, at the center of their efforts to understand and explain the word. There is a fascinating book. I don't know how wonderful it is for a historian of science, um, but David Wooden, I can only recommend that The Invention of Science, it's a big book, came out in 2016, I think, who tells lots of these stories. It's really fascinating how this first worked and how it worked against what we nowadays think is the obvious answer to, to um, go about science. So he has some really hilarious con examples of the mental contortions which the early scholars felt obliged to make when they were confronted with unfitting facts. Um, so for a long, long time, I remember that apparently it was thought that if you, if you rub a magnet with, with um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, oh, I'm missing the word in English. Uh, Knoblauch, uh, ajo, uh, <laughs> garlic, right, thank you. With, if you mix, if, if you rub a uh, magnet with garlic, it's not magnetic anymore. And um, I mean, there was lots of evidence that that's not true, but it didn't fit to the theories. Um, okay, I think I made the point. So the question is, why was it so difficult and took so long to accept empirical evidence as the essential test for theories? I think the most important reason was now comes something that political scientists should know a little bit about, the authority conceded to the received theories, or rather to the authors of these theories. And uh, as you will know, in Europe, 
and not unimportant for the development of science in the Islamic world, Platonian and Aristotelian ideas were unchallenged for about 2,000 years, for two millennia, at least until the 17th century. And, and uh, some of you may know that at least Plato, uh, Aristotle is not so very clear. He tried to be empirical, but Plato, he had a very fixed idea about what the word was like, and everything he observed had to be put under these theories. And that was until very late. In Europe, not so fortunate for science, the authority of these old Greek authors received additional support, of course, in Christian theologians who incorporated much of the word with use of either one, first Platonian and then Aristotelian um, ideas into Christian theology. Many of you will know much more about this than I do. The problem of scholars such as Copernicus thus becomes understandable, I think. As long as strong authorities on general epistemic questions remain unchallenged, unfitting empirical observations are an embarrassment. If you, if you see something and it's against the theories, you better not talk about it. You better ignore it, uh, something like that. It, for these scholars, Copernicus and so on, it was an embarrassment rather than, as it is today, a motivation to improve the theories. So I will come back to this um, uh, and uh, to, to this question um, and how epistemic authority still today informs the acquisition and dis dissemination of knowledge. I'll leave that for the moment and come back to it later. First, I need to remind you of a second important reason for the long struggle with the status of empirical evidence in the development of science. And if you paid attention, I said I will do two for each for the science thing and the political thing, so the second is the last one on the science. Um, when it comes to knowledge, I think we can say that human beings have a strong disposition to want to know for sure. We want to know definitely, irrefutably, what is true and what isn't. And I suppose most of us, me, me, definitely, when we first arrived at university, we believed that this is what science provides and what we should learn at the university. But how does one get to certain knowledge of truth? Well, think of mathematics. Mathematicians prove their theorems. Quod erit des demonstrandum is written at the end of their proofs as if to say, done, once and forever. The method by which they perform that feat has been known at least since Aristotle. They use deductive argument or logic. If you know your logic and perform all the right steps, the mathematical result will be certain. Certain given the premises. You put it in the beginning, but you get a certain result. So this was fascinating to the early scholars. When scholars began to reflect on systematic methods to research the empirical world, the ideal was to proceed exactly in the same way as math mathematicians. Uh, a very nice example for this aspiration that is well known to political scientists is Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes, 16th century, mid 16th century, Leviathan, some of you. I, I see some faces that I more or less remember from a long time ago before COVID and some others that I saw on the screen some years ago. Um, and they may, may have been attracted by me with these things. So you perhaps remember this thing about Thomas Hobbes. In the 17th century, he expressly wanted to develop a political science, more geometrico, in the way of geometry. And that meant in the way of mathematicians by um, a deductive argument. Had he intended to do only political philosophy, that would have been OK. Because the deductive method works for philosophy as well as for mathematics, axiomatic uh, sciences. So there you can do deductive work. But Hobbes was obviously interested in empirical questions too. And brilliant as he was, he did not see the difference. And that's just one example of these brilliant early scholars who didn't get this who didn't see this. Only much later, scholars began to understand that 
Empirical science cannot work that way. And my experience is that it is still difficult for students today to understand that all empirical theories in all fields, from astronomy to medicine to political science, and I'm always worried about medicine, I must say, all these sciences are necessarily uncertain and can never be irrefutably proven. And for those of you who did take my courses, you can remember David Hume, and some others will remember um, uh, Karl Raimund Popper, for example, who very late, Hume in the 18th century and then Popper in the 20th century, worked on these problems and tried to get a grip um, on the way of doing empirical science with that ineradicable uncertainty. One of the consequences of this is precisely what makes scientific work so exciting to the scientist, but so confusing for the general public. With the observation of new facts, anything can happen to the theories, that is. Regardless of how well-founded these theories did seem before. You remember this thing about the, I don't know anything about it, but I know how to mention it at this point. Uh, remember Einstein and the relativity theory, for example. That was a totally new way of looking at things. Um, uh, and, and that's, it was very difficult for people to even start believing that he might have some kind of good idea there. And then when science is dealing with new phenomena, with new phenomena that we didn't, that we weren't able to observe before, uh, then things can become really turbulent. And we've just seen this with the COVID-19 pandemic. I think that's a very good example for this. Um, very exciting and very exhausting times for virologists and epidemiologists. Their data and therefore their understanding of the virus and, and the illness, and then also their recommendations about how to deal with the virus were changed practically from day to day. And that was exactly as was to be expected from the scientific point of view, but it proved highly irritating, as you will all remember, to the public at large. People saw scientists being uncertain, contradicting each other, correcting their opinions every so often, all phenomena that did not conform to the idea of science as giving us certain truth, leading to widespread, and, and this was leading to widespread mistrust in particular uh, scientists, if not in science as such. I think this is understandable, but it does have problematic consequences. I'll come to them. Um, but this is the end of the two points on science. Uncertainty, un unknown status of empirical observations as opposed to theories, and the uncertainty. These are the two main points that I want to mention. So now I turn to democracy. I come to the next point. Just like science, Democracy as we know it today is a modern invention. This might surprise you because as we all know, the word democracy comes from the Greek and uh, Pericles and so on, long, long, long time ago. Um, but they had a totally different idea about what democracy means, what that word means. So what we mean by democracy nowadays, that's a very modern um, invention. Um, the development of democracy presupposed a view of the world which did not exist in old ancient uh, Greece, a view of the world in which political institutions were understood to be made by human beings, at least to a large extent by human beings, and not as part of nature, as Platon thought, or imposed by a metaphysical lawgiver, gods, or a god, or something like that. What makes democracy even more difficult to grasp than science, however, is something that we did, I did not mention about science, namely the fact that until today, there is no consensus as political scientists know, but I know there are some people here who are not political scientists, so <laughs> pay attention. Even in political science, until today, it is 
there is no consensus what exactly the concept of democracy means, what the defining features of democracy are. Usually, the least controversial definitions of democracy tend to be rather general, such as, should I give that to you here? Right. Such as, for example, this is a definition that I find interesting by a German scholar, very recent definition. And I quote, democracy is that exercise of political rule where the means and ways and the contents of that rule are authorized by those affected by it. Well, well, here we can already start the debate. That proposal doesn't seem to be very general, actually, perhaps not general enough. Aren't we all affected by who is president in the United States? Don't many current political decisions affect future generations? So if democratic rule must be authorized by those affected by it, democracies don't exist and can't exist. That would not be a very helpful definition because we do want to say something about systems that actually do exist or at least can exist. So we don't want to do theory about ideal things that are, that are totally utopian, that cannot exist. So would the definition, this definition by Niederberger that I just read, would the definition perhaps be more plausible if it said authorized by the citizens subjected to it rather than all affected or those affected by it? Now, with these thoughts, I will not answer that question. I will just want to point out, with these thoughts, we are, we are already in the middle of the debate about the concept of democracy. Alternatively, and that's the last one I will present to you, alternatively, take the probably most widely accepted contemporary conception uh, of democracy, and that is that of John Rawls for the initiated. According to Rawls, a democracy is a political system the institutions and decisions of which reflect the fact that all citizens recognize each other as politically free and equal. That's a very famous um, phrasing by John Rawls, and that is accepted by very many uh, scholars nowadays. Different as this Rawlsian conception is from the previous one, from the one with the all affected, uh, these two conceptions share the idea that in a democracy, the citizens, or even all affected, are sovereign, and public powers are constrained. At least that we can draw from those two rather general definitions. The public powers may not act beyond the limits of their authorization or may not violate the rights that come with a mutual recognition of citizens as politically free and equal, respectively. Now note that these conceptions of democracy do not mention political institutions at all. They don't stipulate that there must be elections every few years, majority rule, divisions of power, and the like. Rather, they focus, focus exclusively on the relationship of individual citizens with each other and with the public powers. And for those of you not familiar with democratic theory, that may seem strange, because maybe you are used to you know, saying, well, democracy, of course, there must be periodical elections, blah, 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 and so on. But that's not what democ democratic theory actually nowadays um, would say. There is a good reason for that. Democracy nowadays is not a morally neutral notion. It obviously has a positive connotation that you cannot get rid of. Some, uh, some of you may know that some political scientists in the, in the last century, in the mid middle of the last century when political science was developed, um, some of the early pioneers in the 1950s and 60s tried to get away from this positive connotation of democracy by using a different word. Polyarchy was one proposal, so let's not talk about democracy. That's not good for science because this has a positive connotation. We want a neutral wor word to say something about a certain type of political system that has certain features. Uh, and that didn't work. It, it just did not get accepted. So we, are, we, are, we stick with democracy. Democracy is positively, um, has a positive connotation. Uh, and that positive value ascribed to democracy cannot 
derive merely from institutional features. So that's why I say definitions by institutional features cannot explain why democracy is seen as a positive thing. That everyone has the right to participate equally is not as such a good thing. There are lots of activities where that would not be a good idea at all. For instance, soccer, word game, cups, or academic conferences. You would not want anybody with the same right to come up here and talk. You hope to get something from me here, and that's why you invited me. I don't know whether I disappoint you. That could be, but, but you select the people. So it's not that everybody's participation is, as such, a good thing. Um, let me check whether I need to give you another slide so that you can try to follow better. <coughs> um. Sorry, I need to get organized. Um, also, majority rule as such is, of course, not a good thing. Majorities, even popular majorities, can do horrible things and have done horrible things. Uh, think of the, those among you who have done political science. Think of Alexis de Tocqueville and John Stuart Mill in the 18th, in the 18th century, 19th century. Um, for example, they had good reasons to be worried about what they called the tyranny of the majority. So it's not that majorities are always a good thing. So these institutional features, majority rule, everybody participates equally through elections and so on, that they do not warrant by themselves the positive value ascribed to democracy. It's the other way around. Democracies must design their institutions in such a way that they reflect and protect what makes democracy valuable according to these definitions, like in Rawls, that everybody is recognized and recognizes each other as e free and equal. And so the institutions must be in that way. So democratic institutions are therefore somewhat variable from one country to, to the next. Um, and it's fascinating to see how variable they actually are. If you look at a number of countries that we in Europe, um, at least in mines, I think, um, often kind of ignore, don't think about, you find interesting institutions that they have. And nobody would doubt that it's a, it's a democracy. But certain constants are widely agreed among democratic theories, at, le at least, to be necessary features to reflect citizen sovereignty, political freedom, and equality, and to ensure that political powers do not violate the limits of their authorization. So now we come to the difficulties of this. Perhaps the most consequential of these institutions that everybody thinks must exist in a democracy, and perhaps the most difficult to understand in its implications is actually majority rule, which in order to prevent the tyranny of the majority, of course, must be accompanied by minority protection, mostly through constitutional rights. I will not go into this. That's just a footnote. The, for the general public, and that's what interests me, it's our situation in dem democracy right now. The general public, of course, isn't aware of the theoretical debate, but it tends to have practical issues with existing democratic institutions as they perceive them, mostly from pretty far away. One common misunderstanding or false expectation regards precisely the implications of majority rule. Democracy is a demanding system and one thing it particularly demands is patience and the willingness to compromise. And that often does not go down well with citizens who hold a strong belief that some specific issue urgently needs certain decisions to be taken. Unless and until your belief is shared by the necessary majority, your personal sense of urgency has no political traction. That's hard to accept, I think. And as we currently see with the climate activists in Germany very much, I don't know whether that exists in Poland too, of the so-called last generation movement, 
Being in the political minority concerning an issue of great importance can lead to huge frustration, disappointment, and sometimes even desperation with democracy as such, and then with actions that are entirely anti-democratic. Um, so this is one point. The difficulty of understanding what, the, what this idea that majority rule is an important or an un, um, a part of democracy that you cannot, um, that, that we always need, uh, that that's a difficult thing to accept in, in a number of situations. And now this point leads me to the second aspect I briefly wish to address, a feature that often aggravates the disappointment with democracy is the perhaps very human difficulty to engage effectively with institutions. It's much easier for us to engage with persons. Uh, this famous idea, at least in Germany, it's a famous idea of constitutional patriotism, Verfassungspatriotismus, for example, seems to be a very intellectual idea. It doesn't talk to the heart, one could say. It, it's not it doesn't uh, um, address your affections. And one consequence of this is rarely talked about. We have the tendency to demand superhuman capacities and a saintly 100% dedication from our democratic politicians, more even than from our soccer stars, I think. But that is inconsistent with the basic idea of democracy that our representatives should be just as free and equal as everyone else. They should be just like us. And we're not superhuman, and we're not 100% dedicated to our professions, and so on. They should have certain skills, of course, um, like in any other serious occupation. Uh, what do they need? So they need something like being able to understand complex issues, be considerate with people from all walks of life, Above all, be good at communicating, designing compromises, and convincing majorities. But they should not be expected to dedicate their entire life 24-7 to their political offices. And they should also not be expected to be omniscient and get everything right all the time. Now, interestingly, and here's something to think about for future generations of students who work on topics of democracy, there are no widely acknowledged standards for the selection of democratic politicians. We do it more or less by rule of thumb or who, who looks good on television, something like that. We do not have a catalog of saying, well, you know, if I, before I vote for somebody, I think I need to tick off certain things that the ability that this person has. Um, this doesn't exist. We have Sometimes something like general standards of propriety, but sometimes not even these. You see people vote for, I will not name names, uh, but I think you will all think of the same uh, recent names, um, political um, personnel that lies, that, is, that are proven liars, or who cannot, cannot get a majority for their proposals, and so on. So um, it's... it's it's kind of a shot in the dark when we vote for uh, democratic politicians. And what happens then, even though we don't have standards and, 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 um, and catalogs and so on, many of us are nevertheless very easily disappointed with politicians. If they don't do what we think they should do, we get disappointed. And that should give us all something to think about, especially since democratic politicians have lately increasingly become targets of hatred and violence. I, I hope this is not the case in Poland, but it is the case in Germany as in other European countries and in the US and so on. The type of persons who are willing to stand for democratic office despite such exaggerated demands and personal risks is not necessarily the type of persons we actually wish for us as representatives. So this has consequences. It's, I put it very theoretically, but it does have consequences. Okay, these are the two points I wanted to make. Majority rule, hard to accept, and then this thing about not accepting the human imperfections of politicians very easily. That's the two things I want to say about democracy. And of course, this has been very selective, very sketchy. Otherwise, I would talk for several more hours, and I need to come to an end. 
I think these points that I made capture some of the major difficulties people generally have with science on the one hand, the enterprise of generating knowledge of truth, and with democracy on the other hand, the enterprise to make binding rules for a society in which all members are regarded as equally free and should be considered equally in the making of the rules. So now, I need to come to an end, but we started a little bit later. So um, I come to my next point, where do these two things come together? Because I've treated them separately so far. So now I need to bring them together. My focus on this topic, again, will be very selective. It will be only on the relevance of truth, knowledge, and science for democracy. There is also the other way around, but I will not talk about that here. Um, and again, I can only point out a few selected aspects which I, which I believe, and we'll see in the discussion whether I got that across to you, I believe they have a major relevance. First of all, wait, I need to see, no, not yet. First of all, I need to make one thing very clear. On my understanding, democratic decision making is not about finding true political answers to certain questions. Well, this does not seem obvious for everyone, although it does seem obvious to me, and I don't know about you. After all, there is an idea of epistemic democracy. Some of you may have heard of that. Some authors think that democracy is desirable or is justified precisely because the majority rule under certain conditions leads to true, correct decisions or at least to decisions that come closer to the truth or that are more likely to be true than the results of other ways of decision making. Some of you may remember Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He's perhaps the best known classical author to have defended such a view. The volonté générale, that's a majority vote. But it's, it cannot err, it's infallible. It's always true by majority decision. I will not go into this, but this is not very plausible, of course. But, and, and there are contemporary authors who also see democracy as a way to discover the truth about where the common good or the common interest lies. As if the common good or the common interest were something objectively existing in the world, just waiting to be discovered. I think that is untenable. So that is not for me at least, for my understanding, a way of bringing science and truth and democracy together. If it were a way to discover truth, then democracy would be a science, and we would be talking about some, something totally different. But I think no one, not even these authors who talk about epistemic democracy, actually believe that to be the case. They do not believe that democracy is a science. So that's the first point. That does not mean, however, that science or knowledge or truth cannot play a relevant role in democracy, but it's another role. That's what I will come to now. Political decisions, and I think that's an important point that political scientists always learn, but the other, others of you in the audience perhaps have n never thought about because you didn't have reason to think about it. Political decisions are political decisions with an emphasis on political. They are about what objectives a society wants to pursue, what things should be aimed at collectively. It's social decisions about what should be put into binding rules. These are questions on which scientific knowledge has no purchase. That is a political question for all of us in a democracy, not a question for scientific experts. But such genu genuinely political decisions depend on information about what can be achieved and how it can be done, with what means, at what costs, and so on. And these are technical questions. Now that we have politically decided what we want to do in a society, and now we have to find out, and, or before we decide what we want to do, we have to find out what can we do with the means we have, and so on, and, and, and which things we can do simultaneously, and which things are mutually exclusive, and so on. So these are technical questions. Technical questions are a different thing from political questions. 
And these technical questions are the questions for experts, scientists and other persons who, for some reason, have special knowledge, have special experiences, and so on. And of course, this type of technical knowledge is needed to make uh, democratic decisions. But the decision making itself um, is not a matter for experts. Experts can only consult. They cannot make decisions in a democracy. They should not. They can. They sometimes do. But they should not do it in a democracy. And so at this point, when experts become consultants for pre-democratic decisions or after democratic decisions on how to go about implementing the decisions, then, of course, we are confronted again with the problems that I mentioned before concerning science. Here, these problems play a role. And I will, I, I've done so much theory, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but that's just my nature. I always do it that way. But let me explain what I mean with two examples now towards the end, and you've been patient for very long. Two um, recent examples, 10, 11. Uh, the case that has probably received most headlines and provoked the most serious political consequences is that of the alleged steal of the 2020 US presidential election. The truth of which until today is firmly believed against all available evidence. There is tons of evidence. It's believed by some 40% of US citizens, 40%. I, we're not talking about a small marginal group of a few per percent, 40 percent, while almost the same amount, also around 40 percent, just as firmly reject that belief. And that is according to a poll published in October 22, a very recent poll. I cannot tell you anything about how good that poll was, but let's take it at face value that that is more or less accurate. The fallout of this split in beliefs about a very central issue for democracy continues to dominate politics in the US until today. And the consequences are well known. I don't need to go into those. I just wanted to remind you of the example. Another very interesting case, this one now in the context of the pandemic, was the case of ivermectin. I don't know whether you followed that, uh, so I need to go into it a little bit more, because I think it's very interesting. Ivermectin, licensed in many countries for use in veterinary medicine, but also in human medicine. It is, a, is used in human medicine for certain things, against worms and lice and parasites of all kinds. This drug became notorious for its career during the corona pandemic. Um, early on in the pandemic, experiments in Australia seemed to show that Ivermectin was able to destroy the virus. Then very quickly, a substantial number of studies claiming to prove the effectiveness of ivermectin as antivirus drug, anti-COVID-19 drug for humans were published. However, there were these studies. However, not much later, serious analysis and meta-analysis proved, proved, showed that practically all of the early ivermectin advertising publications were methodologically unsound or even fraudulent. They reported things that were not tr true, that the researchers, in inverted commas, did not even find. Moreover, it was shown that the dose of ivermectin used in the Australian lab experiments to show that it works uh, they would be highly toxic if extrapolated for human beings, so on the larger scale of a human body. So these scientific findings at the time were widely broadcast in the mass media in Germany. They were, I remember reading about those, and perhaps in Poland too, and they were definitely broadcast in the US. Health experts were warning that the ingestion of ivermectin products in recommended doses is unlikely to protect against or treat COVID while overdosing poses a severe health risk. All these clear and loud expert warnings, however, failed to reach a substantial portion of the populations in various countries. We're not only talking about the US. It's always uh, easy to do US bashing, but I don't want to do that. It was various countries. Uh, 
I have one data about the US. In 2021, in the US, weekly ivermectin prescriptions increased up to 24-fold from what it was usually, while the demand for veterinary ivermectin products, they, they are freely available in the, in the US, but not approved for human use. These um, veterinary products, the demand for that increased sharply and leading to supply problems. They, there weren't enough for the horses and so on to treat with this stuff anymore because so many people bought ivermectin because they thought it would help against COVID. As a consequence, in the US, as well as in Australia, Peru, Austria, and some other countries, where the use of ivermectin was not strictly regulated, or where it even was, at least temporarily, publicly recommended against COVID-19 by politicians, for example, scores of people got ill from ingesting these products. And then others were exposed to increased risks of infection with COVID-19 for relying on the potential of ivermectin more than on mask wear wearing and vaccination. And what is so remarkable about the ivermectin case is the intensity of the social controversy about scientific findings uh, that we saw here. A report published in Nature in 2021, a very respectable scientific journal, quoted an Australian epidemiologist saying, it's, I think, is that on the slide? It's on the slide, slide there. I think I've received more death threats due to ivermectin, in fact, than anything I've done before. It's anonymous people emailing me from weird accounts saying, I hope you die, or if you were near me, I would shoot you. So I think this is a very stark example, but it should be obvious that the political compromises necessary in democratic politics are more difficult to reach when not only political opinions, but also empirical beliefs diverge beyond certain limits. And this does go deeper than perhaps uh, it may appear at first sight. Some of you will know, the political scientists among you, that it is often argued that the huge socioeconomic differences in many countries are not just differences, but problematic inequalities, problematic because they endanger democratic systems when they cause citizens to live practically in separate social worlds. The poor and the rich, to say it very drastically, live in words that have almost nothing uh, in common. And so how could we expect them to compromise on anything or to have some shared interests and so on? That is something that's standard in political science. Um, what has received much less attention is that democracy may be similarly challenged when citizens live in different epistemic worlds, as seems to be increasingly the case. Um, I have a quote on that, I think, on the next slide. But I will not read it because time is running out. I'm, I need to get to the end of my talk. So as I just explained, democratic decisions require adequate considerations on both the political and the technical dimensions. The rationale for accepting the political authority, the right to rulemaking by a majority decision of democratic agents must therefore, I think, to some extent be founded on trust in their ability to reach acceptable conclusions on both dimensions. So, you know, to, to to think that you should give authority to a political agent, to a political representative or something, I think you have to trust him not to be uh, too radical or not to, to be able to pursue political goals that you perhaps agree with on the political side, but also to be able to get it right on the, on the epistemic side, on the, on the belief side. If you think your political representative is a lunatic in, in beliefs, things that you know, have prov been proven differently, why would you have a reason to accept the political authority of that representative? So I think here is a very strong 
um, intersection of the problems with science and the problems with democracy. We do have a problem with, with, the, with upholding the idea of democratic authority, actually. And this question about the empirical beliefs that start to diverge so much add to that problem, even though it's a different area. But they add to the problem. When the epistemic authorities, de facto accepted in a society, diverge so much that they allow, as somebody uh, said, no shared way of interpreting the world. When policies proposed by political agents are based on empirical beliefs, the sources of which are not accepted as epistemic authorities by many citizens, meaningful political debate across the epistemic divide, an acceptable compromise becomes unfeasible. And that is so not merely because the divergent beliefs offer no common ground, because we can't talk to each other because we have um, divergent beliefs, but more importantly because the perceived epistemic incompetence of those who rely on perceived wrong er epistemic authorities necessarily affects the acceptance of their political authority. So I think here, and I, I must say I've never read anything about it, um, and you will tell me whether this sounds convincing or not, but I think this is something that has been overlooked very much so far. And I'm getting to the end, but hold, bear with me a little bit longer. To make matters worse, the very circumstance that in politics, normative and epistemic matters are so intricately intertwined is bound to aggravate the problem because it can be tempting as a political strategy to undermine the epistemic credentials of competing political proposals. So you can use it politically, this thing about the divergent beliefs. It can be abused, and we see that this is going on in some countries um, right now, and it's, I, I think it's really irritating, and it's very rarely analyzed. Um, and if my argument about the connection between epistemic and political authority is valid, such strategies undermine democracy itself, if successfully directed against office holders. And this is likely to work all the better the more politically polarized a society is because of that human tendency mentioned earlier, to make one's acceptance of empirical evidence depend on the authority one concedes to the theories and the authors of the theories, and in the political case we could say the word views or the ideologies, one accepts. If I accept the ideology of politician X and um, politician X has this and that epistemic views, I am pretty likely to accept this as empirical evidence, rather than something that somebody else says whose politics I don't like. Um, so this makes the problem worse. Uh, and the last quotation that I will give you on this, before I really come to the end, is a quotation that I found just 10 days ago uh, from Anthony Fauci. I do not need to introduce him. He said, Something I've never seen in my 54 years in medicine at the National Institutes of Health is that the acceptance or not of life-saving intervention, he's thinking about vaccines, of course, is steered very heavily by your political ideology. And that these vaccines help is an empirical um, uh, thing, and it's there is no reason to doubt, we can never prove this, but there is no reason to doubt that these vaccines help. We have all the evidence one can have about this, and yet people um, do not use this empirical evidence as, or do not see it as true because they believe somebody whose politics they like better. So here again you have this um, very irritating uh, relationship between empirical beliefs and political beliefs. The apparent search of s sources dealing in alternative truth we've been witnessing in recent years is therefore s disconcerting, not only because it may irritate us that substantial numbers of people believe weird things, 
but more importantly, because that they do so is a symptom for a deeper disagreement on epistemic authorities. And one last observation on that side that I want to make, maybe we can discuss about it later. I want to mention the point so that perhaps you have some issues with this and we can talk about it. The increasing notoriety of alternative truth, which has become a standing phrase, is not to be confused with the popular claim that we live in post-truth societies. Because to those people who believe in alternative facts, truth often matters very much. They're not post-truth. It's not that they don't care about truth. They care very much about truth. And they want to have other people accept the alternative facts as true. So it's not that they don't care about truth. So much so they care about truth that it becomes strategically interesting for politicians who themselves perhaps care less about truth to be perceived as epistemic authorities. Witness Donald Trump's efforts to set up that messenger platform, Truth Social. It's not by accident given that name, Truth Social. It's about people making people believe that here is somebody who can give you the truth, the empirical truth, and then also political proposals. Um, and this is a channel for con the continuing spread of unsubstantiated, disproven empirical allegations. So what have I done? I'm coming to the very end. I should have given you that before. Very briefly, I have tried to show in a very selective sketch how science as well as democracy are social enterprises that have rather demanding mental prerequisites. To accept and satisfy these prerequisites does not come naturally to human beings. This presents a double burden for democracy because political proposals and their effective implementation must rely on expertise about empirical evidence and empirical theories. This adds the difficulties people may have with the acceptance of empirical evidence and of the uncertainty of empirical theories to the difficulties they may have to accept political majority decisions as well as the natural human imperfection of democratic politicians. I believe that defenders of democracy need to be aware of these difficulties and to help people understand that they are based on misunderstandings if democratic systems are not to be endangered by these misunderstandings. This is not easy, and it requires constant care. But let me end on a positive note. Education and communication helps. Most people are very well capable of understanding the burdens of science as well as the burdens of democracy if they are adequately taught and informed. So, of course, what this means for the education system and the public communication system needed to support our democracies, that would be the topic for another lecture. And I leave it here. This is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much for your patience.